right, well, it's four o'clock, so I think we're gonna get started. We'll probably have some more people joining in, but that's okay. Um, so welcome, thank you so much for joining us uh, for FAU Harbor Branch's inaugural episode of Behind the Science, a Wednesday web chat. My name is Madeline Arancidia, and I'm from our outreach and engagement team. I'm gonna be your host. And behind me is our beautiful Caribbean Coral Reef Aquarium at the Ocean Discovery Visitors Center. Today joining us, we also have Amanda Nickerson from our, uh, I'm sorry, our Director of Development, not from our Development Department, she's in charge of it. Um, and also Dr. Jim Sullivan, our Executive Director. Um, so. Uh, before we get started, I think it's really important to acknowledge why we're here and what got us here today. COVID-19 has really made us reimagine how we can communicate and how we can stay engaged with our community. And we're trying to figure out how to navigate a new normal. And it's led to some really exciting ideas. And we know how much you love our ocean science lecture series and our other programs. So we wanted to find a way to bring those opportunities to hear about our world-class science and our world-class scientists to you remotely. So this program and this series is really gonna focus on the people behind the science. Today, we've got Dr. Shirley Pomponi with us. She is an ocean explorer and a marine biotechnologist. She has been uh, previously the director of the NOAA Cooperative Institute for Ocean Exploration Research and Technology at FAU Harbor Branch. She held that role from 2009 till 2018. She's been a lifelong advocate for ocean and space exploration. And so getting to participate in the NASA Aquarius missions has been one of her career highlights. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that from her later on. Uh, Shirley's been at Harbor Branch for 35 years, and she's one of our greatest assets. Throughout our chat, if you have any questions for her, please feel free to ask them. We wanna hear from you guys. And the best way to do that is if you're on Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, there's a little button that says Q&A. Click there, type in your question, and then we'll try and answer as many as we can throughout our chat. So with that, um, Shirley, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Madeline. It's very nice to be here. I'm glad to help you kick this off. And I just want to thank everyone uh, for joining today. I see right now we have 53 participants, so that's amazing. And I just want to do a special hello to my three-year-old, almost four-year-old grandson, Jackson, who's watching from his house. And I haven't been able to actually see him or hug him in a couple weeks. So hi, Jackson. Oh, welcome, Jackson. It's always nice to have family participating. Um, so to kick it off, I guess my first question for you, Shirley, is what inspired you to pursue a career in science? Um, well, I, I had always wanted to be a nurse, but when I went to college halfway through between my sophomore and junior year, I had the opportunity to take a field course in marine ecology in the Virgin Islands. And that was it. Once I took the course, I um, was really hooked on marine science. Um, I, and right after that, then I just started setting my sights on going to graduate school and getting advanced degrees in marine science. Oh, that's fantastic. I actually, I got a little bit of my start in the Virgin Islands too, so we have that in common. Um, but that's really awesome. So how did you get from that inspiration to follow marine science to where you are today in your career? Ah, okay, so that's actually a longer story, but I'm going to try and keep it really short. Um, I was doing more ecological research and working up in Maryland and also in Pennsylvania, and then I, but I was on the side identifying sponges as uh, because at the time there was a lot of exploration in the Gulf of Mexico, still is, that required us to do required um, environmental impact statements to be done and. Some of those, uh, most of those involved looking at uh, things that were living on the bottom and many of those things were sponges. And so I got familiar with identifying sponges. And one day in December of 1984, I got a phone call from somebody who asked if um, I could help them identify some sponges. And I said, sure. And I went through the whole spiel. How many do you have? You know, when do you need them identified? How are they preserved? And he said, no, no, 
you don't understand, um, we're actually start, we just started a program at Harbor Branch, and I knew a little bit about Harbor Branch actually from when I went to grad school. Um, and it's a drug discovery program, and we need somebody to help us in our field program and to identify things to collect because the sponges are really prolific sources of these natural products that um, have pharmaceutical properties. And I said, oh, that sounds pretty cool. And he said, yeah, we're going to go out on a ship. We're going to go to the Bahamas, and there's a submersible. You get to do some deep water work. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And he said, well, we're really – I said, well, when, when does all this have to happen? He said, um, well, we're starting – he said, I'm really sorry, it's kind of a late uh, request, um, but we're actually going out to sea next week. I said, and this was December at the time I was living in Pennsylvania and it had already snowed four times. So I said, send me a ticket. And that's how I got involved in the Marine Natural Products Drug Discovery Program at Harbor Branch. And it's just been, um, you know, I would have never imagined back when I was in college or even graduate school that I would be doing what what I'm doing now and what I got to do, you know, starting 35 years ago. That's so cool. So you've gotten to go down in stubs and I'm assuming you've traveled all sorts of amazing places. What would you say is the coolest place that you've gotten to go to with your research? Yeah, I, you know, I was thinking about this. There were, um, there were, I've been to so many really, really interesting places all over the world. I mean, that's been, I think probably the, um, probably the greatest perk has been the travel and being able to dive in the submersible. Um, and there were so many really interesting places, Galapagos, um, Mariana Trench for sure um, was on my bucket list. But I would say probably the coolest place was being able to live underwater for nine days in the Aquarius underwater habitat. That for sure was the, the, the I think the coolest place I've ever been as a result of my research. And Alan, I don't know if you're watching, but if you are, thank you for giving me that opportunity. So for anyone in our community who's not familiar with Aquarius, can you tell us a little bit about what that undersea lab is like and what that program was? Yeah, the Aquarius under, undersea habitat's been in operation for a number of years. Um, it start, it was initially in the in Virgin Islands, actually, Madeline, you may be aware of that. And they, they moved it to the U.S. And the idea was that it was going to be an underwater laboratory for people to go live and work and make excursions out of the habitat. And the idea was that it was originally going to um, be moved from place to place, but then it never, it, it, it never got moved from place to place. It's always been in... Um, you know, in the Florida Keys, um, it's about, it's at 60 feet deep. Um, the, the reef there is 60 feet, but the, it's offset a little bit off the bottom. So I think it's about 45 or 50 feet off of the bottom. And um, yeah, I'm thinking of other cool places that I've been to. Lake Baikal in Russia, which is also very cool. And Cuba, I've been to Cuba as well. So lots oh, of really interesting places. Yeah, I've been very, very fortunate in being able to travel and do a lot of different things, see a lot of different places. Yeah, it sounds like it. So probably a difficult decision, but what would you say is the coolest animal or organism? That you've well, seen? anybody who knows me knows that the answer to this is going to be a sponge. <laughs> That's what I work on. But I would say probably the coolest sponges I've ever seen were um, um, using an ROV in the Mariana Trench. There are sponges there that look like ET and I mean just the most amazing sponges, deep water, you know, really deep water sponges. Um, that, that, you know, I had never seen before or had only seen pictures of, you know, d uh, drawings that these scientists had, had made like from 200 years ago based on trawls that had come up and, you know, how they had just painted them and kind of imagined what they would look like underwater. So, so my personal curiosity here, um, I know I've seen a lot of shallow water sponges. Are deep water sponges those same bright colors? No. So very rare to see. No, they're not. They're usually white, um, and uh, every now and then you might see something that's yellow or blue, but mostly they're white. Oh, but still very cool. <laughs> yeah, and well, because they have really lots of different shapes and sizes, and you know, the, they're these glass sponges that are just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so during your research, have you ever had something surprise you, an unex unexpected result that turned out to be like exactly what you were looking for in the end? Um, well, yes. I mean, there have been lot, there are lots of times when you're doing experiments and 
it, they don't work. You don't get out, you don't get the result that you intended to get. And that's how we learn and kind of develop new hypotheses to test. But probably the most important one in, in my research career was um, testing some, one, one of my goals was to be able to develop a sponge cell line and we'll probably go into that later. But um, we had worked for many years, like you know, 30 years, 25 years on that, and a new number of, of uh, students, graduate students, undergraduate, summer interns, colleagues, um, and just no luck. And I had a student who developed a nutrient medium to grow these cells, and it just wasn't working at all. And the, the sponges that, you know, was our, our lab rats, or the models we use, the two species that we use for the last 25 years. It just wasn't working on either one of those. And then my um, lab coordinator, um, Megan Conkling, said, well, you know what? We have all these sponges in the freezer that we've cryopreserved the cells. Why don't I try this medium on, on them? And it worked on, on more than half of the other species of sponges that we had in, the, in our freezer this nutrient medium work, worked and it actually led to the development of a, a cell line. So that was really an un, you know, unexpected um, and you know, really serendipitous discovery actually. What a nice surprise when it's just this last the importance of how, Yeah, but it's the importance of teamwork and having other people kind of you know, bring their perspective and say, well, why don't we try it this way? Why have you thought about doing this? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So how many people do you usually have on your team? How many people do I usually have on your team? Um, it, well, I have, we have, I actually have an extended team. So I have my team at um, Harbor Branch and there are, and it's a small group, there's just four of us, but then I also have, there's a team at Wageningen University in the Netherlands um, and I've been collaborating with my good friend Renee Weifels there in the bio, a bioprocess engineering group in Wageningen. And, and we've had like, well, we have a, right now we have a group of about one, two, three, four, five, about seven there as well working. So master students, PhD students, and uh, researchers, professors there as well. And different, and not only in bioprocess engineering, but in another department as well. So it's a, it's that group our group is actually the FAU group and the Wageningen group together. So the Netherlands too, you've got another great spot that you get to travel to. Yeah, unfortunately, and in fact, I teach a, a class there every year, a marine biotechnology class every year, and, and I've been doing it for, I think this will be my 13th year, but it's in May, so obviously I'm not gonna, we're gonna be doing that online as well. Well, you're getting some good practice today then. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, I don't know. <laughs> So what do you think is the most fascinating thing about ocean science that most people don't know already? Uh, I think based on the fact that I've had the opportunity to explore and I've explored in a lot of places, I'd, I'd say that the mo one of the most fascinating things that people don't know is that there are a lot of things that are living in the deep ocean. And we don't, we only know a fraction of that. We've only studied, we've only explored a fraction of, of the, the ocean bottom, the deep ocean. So I think that's probably something that's really fascinating, even in the very deep ocean, you know, even deeper than 6,000 meters, there are, there are things that are living there. And that biodiversity is really so important to the functioning of our global ecosystem. Wow, I didn't even know that. <laughs> uh. That's amazing. So if you could accomplish this one thing over the course of your career, what do you hope it is? So, um, I'm glad you asked that question because I've actually accomplished it. So my career goal was to be able to develop a marine invertebrate cell line because there aren't any. There are, you know, there are mammalian cell lines. That's how we study disease processes, cancer cell lines. There are insect cell lines and plant cell lines that are used for agricultural research, but there are no invertebrate cell lines, uh, no marine invertebrate cell lines. Um, and uh, we actually did that last year. Our team, the team in Wageningen and the team at Harbor Branch together, working together and actually developed a, a cell line um, early, last, early last year. Actually, it was a little in, in 2018. 
Um, so it was pretty exciting for us, very exciting. That to me was, I, you know, we, there were many years, uh, more than 25 years of trial and error, incremental improvements. You know, we, we would discover some little thing that would improve the whole process, but um, it wasn't until this new nutrient medium was developed. And even though it didn't work on the sponges that we always worked on, then again, a member of my team, Megan Conklin, tested it on some other sponges and, and it worked. And then together, working together, the group in Wageningen and the group at uh, Harbor Ranch FAU, we've really taken that uh, even further. So, so I'm really pleased. Now it's, it's kind of exciting because, um, I, I mean, I have to be honest with you, I didn't think that we would, I, we'd be able to achieve that and we have. And so now it opens the door for a lot of other interesting things to do. All right, awesome. Would you mind explaining what a cell line is and what the significance of that is? Yeah. So um, I'll, t I'll tell you in terms of a sponge cell line. So for sponges, what we do is we take that adult sponge and we dissociate it, basically like cut it up into little individual pieces. And then what I actually do is squeeze it. We squeeze it through gauze or... Um, uh, usually gauze, and um, and it and you get these individual cells that and for sponges it's kind of cool because sponges are very simple organisms, and um, the cells will reaggregate or you can keep them separate as well. But we've just never been able to get them to divide in culture. For mammalian cell lines, it's pretty much done the same way. They'll take an organ, whether it's like liver or a tumor, like a tumor, and do the same thing, dissociate it into individual cells, and then put those cells in a, new, a liquid that has nutrients in it. And so cancer cells are like, have unlimited lifespan, so they'll just continue to divide, divide, divide. So that's not an issue, you know, keeping them alive and different types of tissues, different types of cells require different types of nutrients, even from mammalian, you know, human tissues, human organs. So um, part of the challenge, no matter what kind of cell line you're trying to develop is being able to get the, the conditions for culture um, worked out. And so the significance of that is for, as I explained for the mammalian cells, um, and for example, our, our group in uh, Biomedical Marine Research Group at Harbor Branch uses cancer cell lines to test the extracts that we get from different marine organisms. So a sponge extract can be tested against cancer cell lines in Esther Guzman's lab. And depending on how those cells respond, we can determine whether or not they, the, the, that particular extract that was derived from a sponge or a Borgonian um, is effective. For sponges, it's kind of interesting because what we can do now is figure, well, it was my hypothesis many years ago because the sponges that produce these compounds, the compounds are produced in very trace amounts. And it's not feasible to go back into, into the wild and collect the sponges to get enough material to develop into a drug. And, and um, you know, so wild harvest isn't an option. Usually aquaculture isn't an option. Um, if they produce, if there are microbes inside them, the sponge that produce that compound, it, that you might be able to ferment the microorganisms, but so far that hasn't been a feasible option as well. So we had hypothesized that we could grow the sponge cells and the sponge cells would produce the chemical in culture but we hadn't been able to produce, you know, grow the sponge cells. So now we can start testing that hypothesis and see if we can get the cells to grow and, uh, and produce the compounds and culture. And it's kind of exciting because we have at least two sponges that are very responsive to our nutrient medium that do produce bioactive compounds. So now I'm going to be working with um, Amy Wright in our biomedical um, uh, marine research program to see if we can get those sponge cells to produce the compound in, in culture. Discodermalite is the compound. Okay, well, so good luck to get about that. that. Yeah. So just a quick reminder for our audience, if you guys think of any questions, then go ahead and use that button at the bottom of the screen that says Q&A, you can send those questions. I've got a couple more questions that I've uh, planned out for Shirley, and then we'll get to your questions in just a few minutes. So. Uh, so Shirley, what advice would you give to a future scientist or a young person who's thinking about pursuing science as a career or marine 
and science at Purdue. So I think the first thing is that you don't have to get a PhD to do marine science. Um, you can, there are a number of opportunities available at advanced education, whether it's an associate's degree or an undergraduate degree or a master's degree, can get you into different branches of marine science. And the other is, if you are planning on, on getting an advanced degree, I, my recommendation would be to get a good basic like education in, in STEM, in science, technology, engineering, and math. And, and that way you're prepared for um, new opportunities and ways to conduct ocean science because there are a lot of new technologies that are being developed, not a, a lot of different ways to approach um, some of the major questions in ocean science. And having a good basic uh, education in, in, in the STEM fields will prepare you. And also, you're, you, know, you might change your mind and at some point say, you know what? I mean, like I did. I mean, halfway through my undergraduate career, I decided I don't want to be a nurse. I want to be a marine scientist. So um, if I had just been following nursing courses, it would, I would have had to take more to be able to to have the prerequisites to do um, ocean science. So my advice would be to, to try and keep it, you know, you can go ahead and major in an ocean science um, discipline, but make sure you get all, you know, other basic sciences in as well. Make sure you get your chemistry and engineering and physics in as well, geology. <laughs> the broad knowledge base is yes. Yes. important. Yes, my advice, <laughs> yes. So looking back at your younger self, what advice would you have given yourself at the start of your career? Um, sorry, Jim, don't ever agree to be an administrator. <laughs> so that would probably be, I like being in the lab. I like being in the field. I like tinkering with things. I like doing experiments. And there's this, you know, as you, as you do, a, you know, get better and better at doing your job, the temptation is that you're going to be promoted into higher and higher positions. And so um, if you really like doing the science, just think really carefully before uh, you accept a position as an administrator. <laughs> well, it seems like even if you've taken those roles, you've been able to get back into the lab. So. Yes. <laughs> uh, so you have mentioned a couple times that you were thinking about nursing. If you weren't in uh, this field of science, is that what you think you would be doing as a career? Um, well, I think that if I were gonna be in any other field of science right now, well, nursing right now, I think would probably be really important, but I've been thinking about this for a while, and especially since I'm such a space groupie and interested in life, how life evolved on this planet and on others, my, I would go into astrobiology. I would be an astrobiologist. Okay, cool. There's so much to explore both in the oceans and in space. Mm -hmm. um, so we've talked, we've jumped around a little bit. We've talked about um, some of the importance of your work in finding new cancer treatments and new antibiotics. Um, it's pretty clear that that's relevant to our daily lives. Uh, is there anything uh, that you'd want to add about how important sponges are? <laughs> Well, I'd like to like even think more broadly about this because I mentioned how important it is in terms of exploration, not only, you know, of other planets, but of our own. And especially learning more about um, the biodiversity of our of our oceans. And when I think about this in terms of what's going on right now and how much we are really in need of new therapies, both to prevent diseases and to, to treat and cure diseases. Um, we, I think there's, a, there's still so much to explore and the, the oceans have so much biodiversity and so little that has been tapped. And uh, so I think that being able to continue that, uh, you know, ocean exploration and applying that biotechnology and the new, you know, the, the, some of the new fields that have emerged over the last decade or so in terms of artificial intelligence and marine lear um, machine learning and apply those different technologies to getting even a, a more rapid um, uh, pace of, of um, discovery and especially for things that's gonna, that are going to help society. And so, I mean, I feel really fortunate that I've been able to be involved in, in both exploration and marine biotechnology and as part of a, of a team with different complementary expertise that we've been able to contribute to that. 
So that covers all of my questions. It looks like we've gotten a couple questions from our community already. So again, another reminder for you guys that are uh, tuning in and listening to all of this, that if you have any questions that you want to ask Shirley, go ahead and use that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen um, and we'll try and get through all of them. So um, first question that I'm seeing right here is actually from Jackson. It says, <laughs> <laughs> what? What is your favorite sea creature? Um, well, I already know what his favorite sea creature is. My favorite sea creature is a sponge. And one day, Jackson, we're going to go snorkeling, and I'm going to show you all the beautiful sponges in the ocean. Okay. That's a good, good answer. And right, right on your message as well. Um, a related question about sponges. Somebody's asking, are sponges symbiotic systems? That's also a very good question. So we think about this now, we're starting to think about this in terms of a holobiome that's fun, that, that and even when we think about our, you know, our cells, that the, the gut microbiome and microbiomes in other organisms. And for many years, um, I mean, we know that sponges are host to, uh, you know, probably thousands of different microorganisms, maybe even more than that, millions of microorganisms. What we don't know is how, what the role is that those microorganisms play for the, in this, for the sponge. So we don't know, and, that, and, and that's the other thing that having the sponge cell line is gonna help us to, to test. You know, are there uh, microorganisms that live in association with a sponge and can't, and the sponge can't live without those microbes and the microbes can't live without the sponge. Um, thinking at a, at a broader scale, there are also a number of other um, symbionts or other organisms that live in association with sponges. So there are um, sea, um, brittle stars and some fishes and some mollusks, snails that, that live actually inside sponges as well. Okay. Cool. Real, sponges are actually pretty important in terms of providing um, habitat for um, for a number of, of uh, commercially important uh, species like lobsters and some fishes. Uh, next question is, at what age did you start to show an interest in marine science? Uh, did I start? To, that was when I was bet between my sophomore and junior year in college. So what would I have been, 18, 19? I didn't learn how to swim till I was nine years old. So this is, you know, it, it, it's pretty, although we spent our summers, summer vacations at the New Jersey shore, I didn't, I didn't learn how to swim till much later. Oh, so the ocean didn't call to you from a young age? <laughs> no, no, it called to me for vacation and going in the ocean and jumping on the waves, but not to, to study. Um, there's a second question from the same person. What is your favorite place to dive for pleasure? Um, probably the Bahamas. That was my favorite. I've, and again, I've been really lucky to go all over the world diving. And so we've been some, to some really beautiful places, Palau, the Solomon Islands, I mean, just really beautiful places. And the further away you get from civilization, the, the, the nicer the, the reefs are. But I would say that probably my favorite places that I've ever been diving, both scuba diving and in the submersible, have been in the Bahamas. Uh -huh. What has been the most rewarding part of your career so far? Um, that's a very easy question to answer. For me, the most rewarding part has been getting to meet and work with um, people from all over the world and to continue to be inspired by my students who bring new perspectives to, to, to the science. I mean, you tend to get kind of like tunnel vision and focus on something. And then a student will ask a question that he or she may think is just totally off the wall. And it makes you stop and think, oh, you yeah, know, why didn't I think about that? So for me, the, the collaborations, the, the professional relationships that I've been able to cultivate over the last, you know, 35 years have just been, uh, that's the absolute best part of, of of my career. We actually have a question that sort of bounces off of that then. Um, if you could work with any scientist, past or present, who would it be? <laughs> I was afraid somebody was going to ask me that question. I've been thinking about this and um, I know like the 
the typical response should be something like Albert Einstein or Charles Darwin or something like that. And there are actually two people. One, I've worked with a little bit in the past, and I think I consider him to be the Renaissance man in sponge science. His name is um, Jean Vasselet, and he's in Marseille. And he does so, he's just um, very well-rounded in, in sponge biology. And he's the one who discovered the first carnivorous sponge, sponges that don't filter out particles. They actually capture little tiny shrimp and, and digest them. So it would probably be Jean Vasselet. But then also I was thinking about this and um, I heard a lecture about 15 years ago from um, a professor at the um, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and her name is Mina Bissell. And Mina gave a presentation about her research in breast cancer and she had started, she was one of the first ones who started to develop three dimensional models, cell culture models for breast cancer and to be able to better understand how breast cancers develop. And that's actually what gave me the inspiration for starting to do some 3D cell culture work with sponges. So it would probably be working with Nina as well. But if anybody asked me the question about who I'd want to have dinner with, living or dead, it would have to be Jacqueline Kennedy, Jimmy Buffett, and Albert Einstein, the, the, yes. uh, the famous people. Living. That would be such an interesting crew to have at your table. <laughs> Good answer though, man. Makes me want to think about what that dinner would go like. <laughs> oh, wow, hopefully it would lead to me getting a backstage pass to a Jimmy Buffett concert. <laughs> <laughs> um, our next question is, um, what is your advice for women in science who are developing their careers and who also want to have a family? Like, how do you balance work and family? I think it's get, um, I'll tell you what, if you had asked me that question probably when I first started, I would say it was really, almost impossible to do um, because, um, I, in fact, when I started grad school at the University of Miami at the Rosenstiel School of Marine Science, there were 100 grad students and there were only six women. So, and that was in, the, that was 1971. So we've come a long way since then, but I think that the opportunities now for, um, for, for women to have a family and to be able to practice science are much greater. Um, I think there's a greater awareness and an understanding. Um, I hope there is at least by um, employers. And I think there's also, um, you, know, for, you know, if you have a partner in that relationship that your partner is willing to share some of that um, responsibility for, um, for helping to raise a family as well. It's still tough, it's still, it, it's still tough. But um, I think for me, um, you know, the fact that I didn't have little children that I was, you know, that I, that I was responsible to take care of when I was developing my, from my career actually enabled me to do a lot more than women whom I saw who did have children and, you know, weren't able to, you know, go out on, on research expeditions and stuff. But it's, it's a lot different now. Um, and again, especially because of the awareness of employers and of your, you know, your, your family and extended family about sharing responsibilities and about providing other opportunities to conduct your research. Awesome, thank you. Especially as a woman in science, I'm always happy to hear that advice. Uh, next question that I've got here, uh, how do researchers in related areas share information so that each may benefit and advance their research? Um, we try to do that uh, you know, certainly being able to do like kind of Google searches when you're trying to figure out, okay, has anybody done this? Um, and being able to, you know, do searches through your typical, you know, literature um, outlets like PubMed or things like that. You can learn about what other people have done. And of course we share, we, we also go to scientific meetings and they can be relatively small, focused on a particular discipline, discipline like, you know, sponge biology or sponge research or they can be much broader in ocean science or broader still looking at kind of the, you know, AAAS, the American Association for, um, for the Advancement of Science. So being able to go to those meetings and learn what other people are doing and being able to share with them what it is that you're doing often opens up a lot of opportunities for collaboration that you would not have, um, you know, you not have been able to, um, to take advantage of. The other thing is that when you're asked as a, as a, as a scientist, even, and especially as a young scientist, 
um, you know, an early career scientist, when you're asked to serve on committees for, you know, like National Academy of Science, or when you're asked to serve on proposal review panels, you should do that because you get to meet a lot of people outside of your area of research. And again, that opens up new areas for collaboration. Awesome. Uh, next question is, what is that cool old dive suit behind you? <laughs> So that's a dive helmet. It's a hard hat helmet that was that's um, that the sponge divers, the Greek sponge divers, used to use. Actually, I guess they still use them. Um, and um, it's my husband, Don Liberatore, um, collects uh, hard hat helmets, and so that's one of his helmets. But it's one that I bought for him a few years ago, and it was made by the grandson of a helmet maker who used to make helmets for. Um, for, for the sponge divers uh, off of Tarpon Springs and the Gulf of Mexico. So it's an actual, it's an actual hard hat dive helmet. Would you ever use one of those when you go diving? What, um, actually, when we were training to do the, uh, at, uh, live in, uh, and work in Aquarius, we actually used a hard hat helmet as well. Um, it's a lot different from that one, but we actually did use a hard hat helmet. So the one thing I will say is they're really heavy and your neck gets very sore from like you know, it, they're heavy. They're really, really heavy. And even underwater, they're heavy. Uh, next question. Can you describe what it's like to take a trip to the deep sea? Oh, gosh. Um, I think for me, and maybe let me, I'll try and think about the first time I took a, a made a dive in the submersible. Um, first, you know, when you get in the submersible, the, the, we were really lucky because we had the Johnson Sea Link submersibles and they had this um, big plexiglass sphere in which the scientist and the submersible pilot sat. And so you had, you know, you could see all around you 360 degree visibility. And so, I mean, at first you're kind of a little bit, kind of a little bit, I don't want to say scared. I was excited. I couldn't wait to get in the water. And as you go down, you start seeing things, especially in deep ocean, that you don't, you know, that you don't see when you're when you're scuba diving. And so, scuba diving is typically, you know, shallower than a hundred feet. But then, once you start going deeper, things get darker, and and uh, you know, and again, depending where you are, that light filters out at you know at a different depth. And then, when you the the lights go on, and you see all these things around you that are either flashing, bioluminescing, or really unusual fish, or um, these you know, types of jellyfish um, that are just um, either floating by or swimming by. And then you land on the bottom, and that's where you, you look around and you say, wow, look at all this cool stuff. And then you stop and you think, um, there are four of us in the sub, two in the front and two in the back, and we're the only four people who are seeing this at this point in time. Now it's come a long way since then because now through telepresence and using remotely operated vehicles, you know, anybody who can tune in to, to the internet can take part in these missions, these exploration dives and go down. So NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration um, actually has um, uh, you know, regular missions where you can participate uh, you can go online and you can you can watch the dive. You can see what's going on in, in real time. You can see those those um, creatures. Um, and there are a number of opportunities, not only the Nautilus also through the Ocean Exploration Trust has the same type of program as well. So I would encourage anybody who hasn't had the opportunity to do a deep sea dive, you can do it and you can do it in real time and you can do it sitting in your jammies, you know, in the middle of the night watching on, a, on, on your computer if it's somewhere on the other side of the world. So it's pretty cool. But you can just Google um, ocean exploration or NOAA ocean exploration and you can get information on how to participate in dives that way. Cool. Um, a similar question about your experiences deep in the ocean. Um, somebody would like to hear more about your experience living in the Aquarius. What was it like to live and what were you working on during that time? So I'm going to, uh, I was supposed to give a lecture for the Ocean Science Lecture Series on this exact topic and um, we had to cancel all of our public events. So I would just like to say stay tuned because I'm scheduled to do that lecture as soon as we're able to have the um, 
the, you know, the public gatherings again. And if it turns out that it's not going to be for a while, maybe I'll do an online um, uh, webinar and, and talk a little bit about that. But it was an, a NASA mission, so um, and it's an analog for space planetary exploration. So it's a way that NASA trains its astronauts to actually basically live in a confined space and do experiments that somebody else has asked you to do um, in a, you know, really in a small space. So for me, it was very cool because since I'm such a, you know, a NASA junkie and astronaut groupie, I actually got to live and work with two astronauts and another um, scientist and then the two technicians who kept us alive for nine days. Um, so there were six of us in this really small enclosure, but it was real. we did a lot of different experiments, mostly designed to see how you perform under stress, uh, you know, under the stress of, you know, working in, a, in an extreme environment and multitasking and doing different things. Um, and I'm probably kind of giving away too much, but one of my favorite things to do is they were testing to see how much you could multitask. And one of my most favorite things to do that I was totally unable to do when we practiced it on shore, but when I was in the habitat, I had to be able to land a lunar module, like a simulator, a flight simulator for land. And I don't do joysticks or any of that kind of stuff. So that was my absolute favorite thing to do. And each time I did it, I nailed it because we had to do a bunch of different other things as well. So, um, you know, while we were trying to land the, the module. So after that experience, it actually, again, leads into the next question if you were given the opportunity to go to Mars would you go no I would never survive um, takeoff <laughs> I'm um, I have I'm afraid of heights so um, the takeoff would probably I probably have a you know a, a heart attack or stroke on takeoff so no I probably I shouldn't say probably I would definitely not ever do that and especially <laughs> now since I know I can do a lot of this stuff remotely I would be really excited to participate in um, exploration remotely, but you wouldn't be able to strap me on top of a rocket and shoot me into space, no way. That's so interesting that you're afraid of heights, but you're okay with going to those deep Yeah, depths. Depths. I would go as deep, yeah, no, no, I would, I would go, I mean, if I, could, if I could put on a tank and go, you know, to the bottom of the ocean, I would do that. I'm not afraid of all of that. Okay. Um, so we have a time for a few more questions, so again, Last reminder, if you've got questions, hit that Q&A button at the bottom and let me know. Um, but along with that idea of like what's possible, if there were no limitations on technology or time, what project would you want to do or what experience would you want to have? Um, well, I have some ideas about what I want to continue doing with the, with, my, with the sponges. And one of the things that's a really important project that I would like to continue, because we started building up this, this bank, an archive of frozen sponge cells. And what I'd like to do now is continue building, building that bank of frozen sponge cells as a way to preserve biodiversity, especially since we know now we can grow those cells. Um, so we have a, we actually have a grant, um, I have a grant with um, Amy Wright, she's the PI on the project, um, and it's funded by NOAA, and we're going to start doing that uh, in the fall. Fortunately, we, the, the mission had been postponed for other reasons, and now we're really lucky because if we were getting ready to go out to sea now, it probably would have been postponed. So we're going to be doing some work in the northern Gulf of Mexico, and we'll be collecting some sponges. But one of the things I would like to do is if ocean exploration is expanded to other parts of the globe, um, to be able to teach others how to do um, to, you know, to, to cryopreserve these sponge cells and preserve that biodiversity then for future, for future use. So the technology is there, it's just the time and the ability to teach people? So the technology is partly there. We can get, I don't know if you know, if you remember I said I was able, we were able to get about half of the species that we have to divide and the others are still not responsive to um, the nutrient medium media that we've developed. So we really need to spend more time and figure out a faster way to optimize nutrient media for those other um, sponges. And right now we've got probably about 45 or 50 sponges, uh, species cryopreserved. There are over 9,000 species of sponges. And I'm sure each one of them has different nutrient requirements um, for the cells. So, so that's something that, that's a project that I would uh, like to, um, to, to build, uh, to build on. Awesome. All right, so our last question for the day 
What do you do like to do in your free time outside of work? Um, well, I like spending time with my family for sure. And, um, and that's probably my highest, my highest priority. And, and right now I'm really missing not being able to see Jackson. So I like doing that. Um, I like to read and I like to grow orchids. And the fact that I'm home a little bit more now and I'm not going to be doing all these trips is probably going to give me a better opportunity to really take care of these orchids because they've been suffering from benign neglect for a while. Well, that sounds like a really good opportunity for you then. So um, that's about all the time we've got for today. Thank you so much, Shirley, for joining us. It's been really exciting getting to know you a little bit better. You're welcome. Thanks for all the good questions too. I appreciate it. Yeah, and so thank you to our audience for tuning in, for providing so many great questions, like Shirley said. Next week's Behind the Science is going to feature Steve Burton. from uh, He's the uh, director of the FAU Marine Mammal Stranding and Population Assessment Group. And um, so we hope you'll Zoom in next week uh, on April 8th at 4 p.m. for that chat. In the meantime, if you want to learn more about FAU Harbor Branch, then definitely check out our website at www.fau.edu slash HBOI. There you can read more about our research projects. You can watch some of our archived ocean science lectures, and you can learn more about some of the other programs that we offer. So we hope that you guys stay healthy and have a fantastic evening. And thanks for joining us. <laughs>